University of Alaska students ended a week of exams yesterday, and most of the nearly 1,000 dormitory students and many of the off-campus students are leaving Fairbanks for the more than three weeks of vacation. A few dozen students always stay on campus for the duration, but it's a quiet, lonely place with little activity. Nearly 100 students will be graduating after this semester, over 80 with bachelor's degrees, and 10 to 12 with graduate degrees. There is no mid-year commencement ceremony for these graduates, however. The largest majority of students leaving the university for the holidays either fly or take the train to Point South, either Anchorage or their homes in the lower 48, or Hawaii, which is a popular Christmas vacation trip for those who can afford it. More than 200 boarding home students from more than 50 villages in the area surrounding Fairbanks have also headed home for the holidays. These are high school students who do not have high school facilities in their hometown. Leaving by scheduled airline, flights, or charters, the students are going to such areas as Barrow, Fort Yukon, Anaktuvik Pass, New Lotto, Toke, and Kotzebue. Colleen Redmond, the coordinator for the boarding home program, says the school district allows these students a day or two leeway at the beginning and end of the vacation to allow for the problems of flying in and out of remote village areas. She told of one group of students who paid their fare by selling a quantity of masks sent in from their village. Most will be returning either the 2nd or 3rd of January. And this afternoon, students in the North Star Borough got out for a 10-day vacation. The students at Joy Elementary School were typical of those in all borough schools who were getting out. They ran rather than walked from the classes, and teachers seemed a little more indulgent about noise and disorder in the hallways. Schools will open their doors again on January 2nd. It seemed today that everyone was boarding train, plane, or bus and going somewhere for the Christmas holiday. Most were going to the traditional Christmas destination, home. Terry Foster for Broadcast Center News. Although the arts and crafts shop has been in operation 10 years, it has only been at its present location at 102 Lacey Street for a little over one year. The little shop is tucked away in a corner of the Native Community Center and operates on a non-profit basis. Pauline Carlo has worked with the store since its beginning, both selling and creating many of the items on display. She said the store attracts most of its customers during the summer tourist season, but quite a few also come in during the Christmas season. The items for sale are both practical and decorative and are all handmade by Native craftsmen. Mrs. Carlo said the shop was originally created as a place for Natives to display the kinds of things they could do. Also, she said they can get whatever price they ask for their goods. Mrs. Carlo said that often when natives used to take their handcrafts to other stores in town, the stores would sell them for three or four times the price they would give to the artist. The items for sale range from a set of elaborately carved wooden paddles to silverwork, mucklucks, parkas, moccasins, painting, prints, ivory carving, soapstone works, and letter openers made from baleen, a substance from inside the whale's mouth. Most of the items are brought in from the outlying villages, with the artist determining what price he wants to ask for them. There is no charge to the artist for the sale of his materials. Not all of the items sent in are sold in the store, however. Mrs. Carlo explained that in order to keep up a reputation for high-quality products, they will send back items that are not well made. Several women in Fairbanks also contribute their work to the arts and crafts shop. Once a week, a group of about a dozen women get together at the Native Center to sew. Many of those items go on sale at the shop. Hannah Solomon, who says she has been doing beadwork for as long as she can remember, usually has her hands occupied doing just that. She puts many of her items up for sale in the store. Another of the women, Etta Lord, spends her time making parkas, cusbucks, and mucklucks, and does a lot of work with skins and furs. Other items for sale are baskets and baby carriers made from birch bark, masks, and other novelty items. The shop does a fairly good business, and there is a rapid turnover of items in the store. Terry Foster for Broadcast Center News. The Santa is Paul Gillum, a 22-year resident of Fairbanks. He hired on at Woolworth's store following discussions between the president of the Fairbanks chapter of the NAACP, J.P. Jones, and the store manager, Bob Hemrick. Gillum is also a bus driver and says that is why he is able to relate to children. He said there have been no problems in his new job with either black or white children, and he talked about his qualifications. 
my dealing with kids for the last last 20 some years driving bus and everything, I found that uh, I like the kids, and usually when you show uh, compassion to them, they'll be better to you. Uh, I've worked for both bus companies here in Fairbanks, and on each one, whenever we had a problem route, well, they would uh, put me on that route for a couple of weeks and straighten it out. I mean, serious problems. And uh, I'm glad that I like kids and they like me and we can communicate. Store manager Hemrick said he is enthusiastic about Gillum as a Santa. Hemrick said in his 11 years in the retail business, he has never had as good a Santa as Gillum. So many people try to call long distance on Christmas Day around the country that circuits are jammed and there are often long delays. Each year, long distance phone companies plan to handle the load. This Christmas is the first that the Fairbanks Toll Center of RCA Alaska Communications has planned for the Christmas rush with direct distance dialing equipment in operation. We spoke with the manager of operator services, Mrs. Polly Shalek, and RCA Fairbanks manager, Ray Stewart, about plans to handle the heavy calling. Mrs. Shalek described the nature of the problem. Well, Christmas is our busiest day, the very busiest day of the year, and it is throughout the whole country. We have at least a 30 to 40 percent increase in the amount of traffic that we will have on that day. Do you increase your staffing to handle this? Uh, everyone works Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, the whole force. Ray, how about the equipment here at the RCA plant? What uh, does RCA do to try to make it possible to handle this large increase? Well, working with AT&T for about the last two months in preparation for Christmas, we will turn up about a 40 percent increase in long distance circuits between here and, and the uh, United States. How are you able to accomplish that? It's a, it's a matter of, of a great deal of coordination. We work with AT&T, we work with CNT, uh, we work with ComSat, uh, and we determine uh, what will best suit our needs and then uh, what will best uh, suit AT&T to give us. Are these general circuits, or do they go to specialized parts of the country? And what we do this time of year is try to reach different time zones. Uh, so we are turning up circuits to Chicago and circuits to New York. Polly, what can someone who's trying to complete a call do to increase their probability of getting through? Well, in the first place, it would help a great deal if they have the telephone number ahead of time. Uh, secondly, now that we are uh, in a position to direct dial, if the customer would dial himself on a station-to-station -station call, if he will dial his access code for station calls and then his number, it will help a great deal rather than dialing in for the operator. Do you have any comments about how the last couple of holidays, uh, Thanksgiving, have gone, the first holidays under DDD? Oh, we were extremely busy this Thanksgiving. Uh, in fact, we were quite surprised that we were as busy as we were. But uh, it, it's a lot easier for the customer and a lot easier for us with our direct dial. Mrs. Shalek said the best way to guarantee getting through was to call early in the day, before 6 if possible. She said the busiest period was from 10 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. If a call is not completed, Mrs. Shalek said the operator will suggest a better hour for placing the call, considering the time zone in the area being called. This is Ted Lane, Broadcast Center News. At the state jail, special meals are served on most holidays of the year. As the head chef at the jail says, the only variety in the inmate's life is his diet. On holidays, the inmates are allowed to sleep in until about 10 in the morning and then come up to the kitchen for brunch. Today, that meant steak and eggs for the 60 or so in the institution. There are only two meals on holidays, brunch and dinner. The Christmas dinner includes baked ham with fruit glaze, roast prime rib au jus, baked potatoes with sour cream and chives, broccoli spears au gratin, scalloped potatoes, fresh fruit salad with whipped cream, and chef's salad with avocado dressing, a cold relish table including carrots, celery, assorted pickles and fruit, hot mincemeat and pumpkin pie with whipped cream, fruit cake, Christmas cookies, hot buttered rolls, coffee, tea, and milk. The inmates eat in shifts of 25 to 30 at a time. The hall was decorated by the inmates, and the meal was cooked up by head chef Paul Ward and 12 inmate assistants. 
Anything that is left of the meal after dinner will be set out for the inmates to snack on in the evening. Normally, about 20 of the prisoners at the jail are not allowed to come to the cafeteria for meals. However, today arrangements have been made for all but four of the inmates to eat in the dining hall. The other four will be served the same meal in their cells. Those prisoners are the ones the authorities feel it would be unsafe to let out of their cells. About seven prisoners were allowed to go home for the day to be with their families. A curious fact about food at the jail, Ward is allowed 56 cents per meal in feeding the prisoners. He said the state buys food quarterly for all of its institutions, jails, and pioneer homes statewide. He said it is not hard to stay within the 56 cents per meal limit. The buying methods, however, do make it necessary for such things as these prime ribs and hams to be bought for Christmas back in October or November, along with the Thanksgiving turkeys. Some have speculated the spread at the jail is almost worth a light sentence. But jail officials say any one of the prisoners would probably change places with anyone outside the jail, even today. Phil Deicher, Broadcast Center News. Nineteen seventy two was an interesting and eventful year from the standpoint of those in the news business in Alaska and here in Fairbanks. What about from the standpoint of uh, the private citizen, private individual, as he looks back at nineteen seventy two and forward to nineteen seventy three and all the possibilities and potentials that uh, that holds? Also, we wondered what sort of New Year's resolutions people make about this time of the year. So we decided to travel to this spot here in the Gavora shopping mall and ask some folks. Your name is if I didn't know, sir? J.C. Hart. And, Jay, what was uh, 1972 like for you and your family? A good year, a bad year, indifferent? A good year, oh, yeah, a good year. Looking ahead, uh, how do you see 1973 for you? Uh, bleak. <laughs> and what are the reasons for that? Unemployment. <laughs> You're, uh, there's, some, there's a story behind that. You're on your way where? To uh, Spokane, Washington, to go to school. Uh, I was employed by RCA at the satellite tracking station, and uh, they lost the contract. And I drew my final paycheck today, and we'll be leaving Fairbanks area around January the 20th. Do you have any New Year's resolutions for 1973? Find employment. Thank you, Jim. Can I have your name? Uh, Daniel Stovell. Are you a uh, civilian or military? Military. Out on Fort Wainwright? Correct. How long have you been here in the Fairbanks area? ever since uh, September of last year. What sort of a year has 1972 been for you in the military in the cold regions of interior Alaska? Well, this is the first time I've been in the snow. I've seen it on television, and I've enjoyed myself so far. And 72 has been a nice year. Where are you from originally? Los Angeles. Well, that is a long way from home. What about 73? Uh, Do you think it's going to be a good year for you or or not? Yeah, we're getting a pay raise January. It's going to be a real good year, starting off. Your name is? Barbara Rothschild. And Barbara, uh, are you married? Yes, I am. Have you been here in Alaska long? Just a year last week, and it was a long year. (laughs) What brought you to Alaska? My husband's a captain in the Air Force, and we were reassigned here. Luckily, he was to go to Vietnam, and at the last minute, they changed the assignment, and we ended up here. So perhaps you're one of the few who really doesn't mind too much being assigned to Alaska in view of the circumstances. Well, that's true. Um, We don't really mind it. Um, It's quite an experience. It's much different than anything we've known. We come from Pennsylvania, and the mountains aren't quite as big there. And we have cold winters, but nothing like this. Well, tell me, on a scale of 10, then, how would you rate the year 1972 for you and your family? Well, on a scale of 10, I'd have to put it at least at 8, because all in all, we had a very good year. Um, I think I said before it was a lonely year. It's a little far away from the family when you have a little one and the grandparents miss the children. But it's, it was a good year. Um, a lot of nice things happened, and we found a lot of new friends here. Really like Alaska as far as the people. Very friendly. Uh, well, what about 1973? What does it hold for you? Are you going to be here all throughout 73? Yes, we'll be here through 73 and part of 74. Um, 
What it holds for us, I hope, is some visits from people down from the lower 48, going to come up and see what we're doing up here. Um, as I say, I have a little child, and with them growing, it, you never know what's going to happen. But we do look for, um, hopefully, peace and a little settling down in the world situation. I find that a little disconcerting up here. We don't find out things as quickly as you would like to, and things are happening every, every place else that you'd like to hear about. And uh, magazines and newspapers, of course, keep you informed, but the radio and TV media is the fastest way. Have you made any New Year's resolutions for 73 yet? Oh, I make the same resolution every year that I'm going to do things a little better myself, my own schedule, and it never comes out that way. <laughs> but uh, I think we should all think about being just as kind as we can to everyone else, and that's probably the best resolution we could all have. Tell me, sir, what kind of a year was 1972 for you? A good year, a bad year, or just sort of in between? In between. Not spectacular? Yes, it was spectacular. What sort of good things happened to you in the last year? Oh, well, I had a good birthday and a good Christmas. Got lots of things, huh? Yes. It must have cost somebody a fortune to buy all those things for you. I think so. <laughs> what sort of a year do you see 1973 as being for you and the members of your family? A good year. Why? What's going to happen that's good? I don't know. I just think it's a good year. You're an optimist then, I guess, huh? Yeah. Have you made any New Year's resolutions for the coming year? Things that you've sort of promised to yourself that you'll do? No. Nothing you're looking forward to? Yes, I'm, I'm looking forward to something. What? Skiing. Oh, you're a skier? Yes. Are you a fantastically good skier? No. Uh, just a, a great skier? Not quite. How would you rate yourself? Pretty good. <laughs> well, we hope you make the Olympic team one of these years. And your name, sir? Rick Holmstrom. I knew I recognized you from somewhere. You know, one thing we've discovered in doing these man-on-the-street type interviews is that even though many people are willing to talk with us, even more people are pretty shy about stepping before the cameras. Even people who already know us very well. Here. Thanks a lot. My own wife won't talk to me. That's the way it goes. Larry Holmstrom, Broadcast Center News, failing about 60% of the time in the Govoro shopping mall.